How's it going everybody? So in this video, I wanted to discuss overtraining syndromes, little sister. This is a common phenomenon that I have seen happen a lot in the average population with general fitness and weight loss goals, uh, but is actually extremely common in athletes. And uh, it has all the same symptoms as what most people describe overtraining syndrome. Uh, however, this is actually the more scientifically validated issue. And I didn't know this existed until uh, I heard about it on a podcast with Dr. Eric Helms, uh, Iron Culture podcast yesterday. Uh, this is called Relative Energy Deficiency in Sport also known as REDS or R-E-D-S. So relative energy deficiency in sport, okay? And so what this is is a syndrome of poor health, lethargy, declining athletic performance, hormonal problems, uh, you'd have sleep issues, all of these things, uh, pretty much all of the signs of overtraining syndrome that you like feel really badly. Um, that is actually due to an increase in energy ex or just a high energy expenditure relative to the amount of energy coming in. Okay. And for me personally, this is why I recognize that calories in versus calories out is the primary mechanism involved in um, weight loss. But I also don't tell people outright to restrict their calories consciously and instead I manipulate the composition of the type of foods that they're eating and the macronutrients to involve more protein so that they can eat enough calories to where they're not like obsessed with starving themselves basically to where they experience problems like these, okay? Because if you're experiencing REDS, as we're going to uh, mention, we're going to refer to it in this video, if you're experiencing REDS, uh, relative energy deficiency as a general population human trying to just lose weight and stay motivated to go to the gym, you are going to completely lose motivation and you're going to find adhering to a regular exercise and nutrition program unsustainable in the long term due to all the negative symptoms that come from keeping your calories too low for too long. Uh, and obviously, if you do an intelligent caloric deficit and you're also tracking your energy expenditure, which heart rate monitors do a very poor job of doing so accurately, then maybe you could avoid like negative symptoms of restricting calories too much. But this is a phenomenon that I have seen, especially in females in the general population where they're just eating way too little and it ends up causing uh, really bad like problems with sleep, uh, like sleep deficiency where they become really tired during the day. They can't fall asleep at night because their body's in a chronic state of, of cortisol and stress. Um, really, adrenaline is what's going on. And then they also have mood problems uh, where their mood is really bad and their appetite actually goes down. Um, all the while, it, the direct cause of that is that they're not eating enough food, especially protein. And uh, so anyway, I don't want to go too deep into that, but I've seen that a lot, especially in the general population and females, and it's really, really bad. And so um, let's talk about, so, so the main cause of that is not, not eating enough calories relative to your energy expenditure, okay? And so there's actually two ways that this can happen. And so a lot of people, they may think that they're eating enough food. They may, they may not change their diet at all, and they're eating the same amount of calories. And then they experience this problem when they increase the volume and or the intensity of their, of their exercise while still eating the same amount of food. So what happens is you may be eating, let's say, 2,000 calories a day, 200 grams of protein a day. Um, and you keep that consistent, you track your food, you weigh it out and everything. And before you're doing, um, three days of cardio, three days of weightlifting. Okay. But then, uh, you decide, and you've been doing that for months and you're losing weight and you're feeling good. Right. But next thing you know, you decide that you want to add 
another three days of cardio and three days of, I don't know, Muay Thai or Jiu Jitsu practice, right? And you're not really going hard in sparring to where you're having concussions or something, but it's a lot of extra exercise. So now you've just added six extra sessions of highly intense cardiovascular exercise on top of your normal three and your normal three weightlifting sessions. And you're still eating the same amount of calories, 2000 calories and 200 grams of protein, but you have like double the exercise, the energy expenditure sessions, um, which is making your energy expenditure, the amount of calories you're, you're, you're burning now, double that of what it used to be. And so now the relative amount of, um, of a core, uh, energy deficit that you're in is double. It's way higher. You are now deficient in double the calories. You're probably expending another thousand calories on top of what you were before to where you may be expending 4,000 or like 2,000 calories a day on top of your basic metabolic rate, which is like 1,000. And so you're now at an extreme energy deficit and you're not eating anywhere enough calories to be able to sustain uh, your new added exercise program, let alone the basic metabolic functions, okay? So in weight loss uh, science, there is a phenomenon that is referred to as adaptive thermogenesis. Because uh, a lot of people have noticed when they're in a caloric deficit, especially if it's too much, but, it's, but even if not, just like for, they're in a caloric deficit for too long, they start to notice that they start to feel shitty. Females will lose their periods. Uh, men will lose their libido. Sleep will start to be crappy and they'll have low mood. And you'll hear in the mainstream nutrition crowd, they'll say, oh, of course you're going to feel crappy uh, because, you know, I feel crappy too if I'm not, if I'm, if I'm forced to deny tacos and Cheetos and candy all the time, you know, and they're trying to say that it's the absence of junk food that makes you feel mentally unstable, which is completely, it's, it's the general intellectual laziness that you'll hear from that crowd when you know, presented with a with real problems that are counter to the, if it fits your macros, uh, paradigm, uh, you know, they're like, these people think that they need fucking Reese's pieces and cheat days to, uh, prevent them from going insane. And if you ask me, that's a mental illness, that's a eating disorder. Uh, not to say that restricting calories is a bad thing, but it's just, if you think you need, um, junk food every now and then in order to keep you sane, there is something very unhealthy about the way you're approaching your caloric deficit. So anyway, um, the point that I'm trying to make is like, that's one avenue is increasing your, your, um, energy expenditure drastically through increasing your exercise program, despite still eating the same amount of calories. You might even increase your food intake to compensate for that increased training load. But as long as the, the amount of exercise or, or, or training, especially if you're a competitive athlete, the amount of exercise that you are doing is way higher than the amount of calories that you're taking in, that puts you at a severe uh, risk for inducing a state of relative energy expenditure um, deficiency, whatever. And I know I'm experiencing that right now, and I probably have pretty frequently throughout my time as an athlete. I'm going to get into that a little bit later. Um, and this might explain why I was able to eat 5,000 calories a day on a ketogenic uh, carnivore diet um, and experience strength gains, better, like my sleep quality came back, and I just felt like an overall amazing quality of life, literally is removing all carbs and eating like a 5,000 calories worth of meat, cheese, and, and butter compared to when I was eating like half the calories, like 2,400 calories, uh, and eating a mixed diet that was really high in carbs, like on average, like 300 a day, 300 grams a day. It probably hasn't, doesn't have as much to do with carbohydrates as it does the fact that I was doing way more cardio back then. I probably solved my relative energy deficiency syndrome by doubling my caloric and my, my caloric intake and my protein intake on that carnivore diet. 
And that's probably why I was able to start suddenly get really lean, uh, experience strength gains, and then my sleep quality came back. It's probably because all of a sudden I was eating all these, like doubling my caloric intake and reducing my cardio, and then my hormones probably came back. Not to mention there's other benefits associated with ketogenesis that can help someone overcome this, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. And I think that's also partly the benefit of MCT oil for many people. Uh, so the other, obvious, the other obvious kind of cause of this syndrome is if you're just uh, under eating f- calories, you know. You could be a sedentary person and just not eat enough calories, and you'll notice you know, low energy and all these other problems as well. I'll also say that you most likely do not have to be like super lean, like in the single digit body fat numbers. Okay. If you're just under eating on a daily basis, especially if you're under eating protein, if you're in a caloric deficit and your protein intake is, is not, you know, increasing dramatically to compensate studies show you, uh, it's probably optimal to get about 2.5 grams of protein per pound of ideal body weight if you are in a caloric deficit to offset some of the muscle loss potential. Uh, Even if you're not lean, you could easily run into this problem without enough protein and just depending on how chronically your low calories are actually going. And I think when people go into on these keto diet, these ketogenic diets, uh, a big reason why people tend to report feeling really, really good Kind of like, you know, seven out of 10 people generally experience greater energy levels on ketosis and and fasting protocols, including myself, especially when I doubled my calorie intake and was taking MCT oil. Um, I think it's because your body is able to offset the negative effects that we're talking about in this relative energy deficient deficiency syndrome, because your body is now more efficiently absorbing and utilizing those calories from body fat as energy Uh, because whether you like it or not uh, studies lasting longer than four weeks on keto adapted uh, individuals actually shows athletic performance mood and all these things tend to be in a upward spiral at least slowly slowly over time Uh, that kind of indicates a and there's actually metabolic shifts that have been identified where your body's able to produce a lot more energy endogenously from endogenous sources uh, over time. And that can explain why people are able to do all these things. Like there's a Muay Thai athlete, Sylvie Von Grutu or something like that. And she's the only Westerner that ever moved to Thailand. And she uh, fought Muay Thai. She fought over like 400, 400 fights now fighting all the best, including Stamp Fairtex, which is a one championship two time uh two to two multi-sport champion and she's on keto and she's doing these uh these one on one off day fasts while in fa- and competing while fasted on a ketogenic diet as a female and that's just insane and i think at first glance you might think damn this this chick probably going to run into some serious hormonal problems a lot of people suspect keto dieters would, you know, they'd crash their hormones and just die basically. But I think you hit a point where your body actually starts to derive the majority of its energy from inside of itself, converting more uh, carbohydrates from the glycerol backbone and triglycerides, free fatty acids, the Cori cycle, lactate, pyruvate, uh, and then also just producing more ketones and other things. You're literally becoming an energy production machine from inside of itself. And, of course, you can still do that when you're eating carbs, but your body is adapted a lot more to producing that energy from the energy on the outside. And so I'm just saying that would explain a lot of this stuff. But the people that actually do it, they start to notice that they have um, these problems go away. But uh, So some symptoms that can happen, okay? A lot of people are just going to turn the video off after listening to the damn keto talk, which is unfortunate because I think it's a very important thing to look at. Um, And it would make a lot of sense because there's no other way to explain it otherwise, like um, other than to just deny that people have good results past the four week mark on keto, which is ignorant because they're ignoring 
So yeah, um, left untreated, REDS can impair systems throughout the body, including uh, reproductive health, disrupted uh, period cycles in females, low libido in men, uh, bone health, you get an increased risk of stress fractures and osteoporosis, like I've seen this uh, in certain athletes. More infections and colds due to decreased immunity. You know, you, you, you'll typically see more injuries, you'll, you'll see more immune system problems in athletes who are cutting weight for competition. I see, I train in, uh, mixed martial artists and other athletes for comp, and whenever they're weight cutting, uh, it can be a real pain in these cases unless they're following my diet protocols. Usually they're, they do better. Um, metabolism, the body converts food into energy more slowly. So I don't know what that means, but it's, this is like one of the articles on a mainstream medicine website. Cardiovascular heart health, low heart rates, like low pulse can happen, uh, causing dizziness and the potential for long-term heart damage. So I would be very suspicious with the long-term heart damage uh, claim because it's impossible to actually control for confounding variables and and study that uh, effectively, you know, long-term heart damage. Like, how are you going to study that? You're not. Um, psychological health, though. But I, and I do think it's, you know, there's probably a lot of long-term health problems that can happen directly and indirectly if you're chronically uh, undershooting your calories. Psychological health, moodiness, depression, and anxiety. I mean, that's a given. Uh, moodiness, depression, anxiety. So um, there's a lot of symptoms that have been documented. And so this is a very important uh, thing to consider is these are all the symptoms of overtraining syndrome, you know, and like there's a lot of people who are who, like I have had commenters from people who say, oh, yeah, I'm, I, I had overtraining syndrome. It's a real thing. I did, um, I did uh, a full, bo full body program. I benched, I bench squatted and deadlifted uh, one set to failure um, like three times a week or something. And I did that for, for, uh, for, for three months or something. And I experienced overtraining syndrome where I just, I couldn't sleep. I felt horrible. I was sore all over. And I felt that for years. It's, it's now been three years since, since I did that, uh, since I stopped uh, weight training. And I still experienced the overtraining syndrome from it. And it's like, bro, you, first of all, if you heard of beginner programs, uh, the novice linear progression, they're doing three sets of five that eventually gets to failure towards the end. And they generally just switch programs and they're fine. Uh, you don't get overtraining syndrome from such a weak ass program like that. And I tried explaining that in more civil terms to these people that will leave comments like that in my comments, but they fight me on it. They're convinced that they've experienced overtraining syndrome. They're like, bro, there's no other way. Two, two years later, I'm still experiencing it. It's like, well, that's a good indication that you're not experiencing overtraining syndrome. Because even with endurance athletes, it usually resolves after like six uh, months or so. But anyway, um, you'll hear a lot of people who do like these like really subtle, easy pr things. And they're just, maybe they're just pushing it hard or whatever. And then they freak out and they insist they're, that they're experiencing overtraining syndrome. And... Um, and when you ask them about their diet, they weren't tracking their diet. They were kind of ballparking their protein and still undershooting. Uh, and almost always, these people are just, they're training stupid. They're not tracking their fucking food. And they don't have a clue what they're actually experiencing. So, you know, you got to be really careful with people claiming they overtrained on the internet. Um, it, almost always, it's some stupid shit that's not accurate. So the thing is, now you look at the scientific literature, and I mean, there's been so many videos in the last decade that have talked about this. Uh, there's whole books written on it where they kind of give the idea that overtraining syndrome is mostly, first of all, the only time it's ever been documented. And what tests are we using for overtraining syndrome? Testosterone to cortisol ratio is pretty much the only thing that we have that's close enough to um, diagnosing it. Almost always, the actual uh, overtraining syndrome, when you see way more cor uh, cortisol and way low testosterone. 
uh, you diagnose overtraining syndrome. It's been verified via blood hormone tests. Uh, and that has only been found in, in marathon athletes, endurance athletes. It's been, people have, uh, there's been so many studies where they do like, uh, le- uh, squat squats to failure, like a 10 rep max every single day. And it's like a six week study or something. And they've over and over tried to reproduce, uh, overtraining syndrome in weightlifters and strength training. And they can't. In fact, almost always you'll see people make strength gains. Uh, literally, I found a study in my strength and conditioning textbook that insisted overtraining existed, and it used that as a example. And then when you look at the study, when you actually read the study, it doesn't say that they like overtrained at all. And in fact, after a one week of complete rest, the performance and symptoms went back to baseline afterwards. So you don't see overtraining syndrome in weightlifters. You just don't. Strength training, even crazy protocols. So a lot of people who tell tell you, oh, no, if you train too hard, you're going to have overtraining syndrome in in regards to strength training, they're just trying to sell you a supplement to help with recovery. They're trying to sell you a program to help you, like, maximize your gains and shit and optimize things. The reality is you just need to make sure you're training hard enough uh, to keep going and and be able to keep – performing each time and make gains and you'll be good but so in regards to like mixed martial arts there's no studies that have proven overtraining syndrome exists um only in air and and endurance athletes and marathon runners okay and so even then after one to two months of complete rest marathon and endurance athletes are good to go okay and something else you have to understand is even then it's like it's like uh zero point Two five out of ten marathon runners that actually will experience that, and that's when they're peaking for competition. When marathon runners train, remember these are people that are, their heart is being worked for hours and hours at a time without any kind of recovery at all, and they're drinking a shit ton of water. Their body's in the catabolic state, breaking down muscle protein. These athletes try to be as light as they possibly can to be able to run. And perform for as for as good as and as long as they possibly can, because the lighter you are, the more the longer you can run is what a lot of people think. So they're in they're usually in extreme caloric deficits. They're in their highest mileage of the year, and they're slamming water, probably salt deficient. Uh, and it's like their whole sport revolves around rhythmic running that lasts, um, you know, six to sometimes 24 to 48 hours nonstop. And you are trying to compare your MMA practice that's not, you know, it's like two hours of a class, but only like 45 minutes of actual intense training. You know, even if you're training eight hours a day, you know, five days a week, you're still not getting the amount of, the overall amount of exercise and and, and whatnot, or even caloric expenditure that a lot of these endurance athletes are. And the other thing is, that could the endurance athlete phenomena where they experience overtraining syndrome could easily be explained by uh, co- relative this this caloric expenditure thing. They're probably just under eating. Um, so it's important to keep this in mind. So overtraining syndrome, as we know it, to be like just like an overall net overtraining. Uh, probably doesn't exist, okay? Overreaching does exist where you're basically going harder on the volume, harder on the intensity than you were before, uh, no matter what the sport is. And then you might experience a short-term decrease in your exercise performance. You might feel achy and sore. But there's no study that shows if you just keep doing that that you're not going to adapt unless calories are low. So the key to understand is your body will literally adapt to the to pretty much anything. The vast majority of crazy protocols you put your body through, uh, if you're able to go through it in one week, it's not over what your body's capable of. Because if you are pushing the limits beyond what your body's capable of, your body wouldn't be able to perform it because it wouldn't. It's past your capability. So that's the first thing. You might feel like shit for the first couple weeks of doing it. But 
adaptation and recovery happen at the same time. Supercompensation is a myth. And with that in mind, literally, if you're able to do something over and over again, your body will get used to it eventually. And I don't even want to get into all the examples like, you know, prison inmates and how they get jacked, which is controversial. Then you have all these uh, military personnel and Navy SEALs and Jacko Willink and David Goggins, and which could be exaggerated. Um, but you have a lot of examples. The Silve, the damn Muay Thai fighter I mentioned earlier. Um, like you might feel tired and you might feel, you know, sore and stuff, but your body will adapt over time. And as long as you're in the more, the more calories are available to your body, the easier it'll be for your body to adapt. People who actually do the Bulgarian method in weight training, you know, they find they're not overtrained, uh, depending on how they do it. And they generally keep gaining strength and they get the craziest strength gains of their entire career within a two month period <laughs> doing the Bulgarian method. So as long as in as long as you do it right, you're not going to injure yourself. And the only people who who freak out about overtraining are the people who haven't really tried to push their limits. Um and so that's overreaching. Overreaching is the tiredness and the soreness and stuff you get when you're pushing your limits. But if you keep that that those limits pushed and you keep doing that training modality over the course of four weeks, your body, that'll be your new normal, right? That'll be your new normal. The same phenomenon that happens when you begin a training program where you're like, all right, um, you know, I'm doing my, you know, I'm starting MMA practice three times a week. At first, that three times a week is going to make you feel like crap, man. But after like uh, two months of, of doing MMA three times a week, as long as your coach is doing, is, is, is a good coach and knows what he's doing, your body will adapt and that'll be easy for you. And you could add a fourth week. Uh, so remember, so, but if you, if you, so whenever you start a new training program, it sucks at first, but your body's whole purpose is, is survival and it will adapt if it's given the right nutrients. Um, now imagine if you just start go balls to wall six days a week at first. I mean, as long as you don't injure yourself and you eat enough food, the same process will happen, but it'll be more intense. You know, you instead of three days a week, you just go balls to wall and you start training like a pro athlete. You know, God forbid you have time to do that, which is awesome. After two months, your body should adapt as long as you're eating and sleeping adequately. So, uh, overtraining, like you, tr you know, like the training itself is not really the problem, as long as you're not doing stupid shit, like you know throwing like kicking a fucking banana tree over and over again that's not overtraining that's just stupid <laughs> you might break your shit you know but your body will adapt to that too there's actual methods of callousing your bone where if you just bang at it enough over time uh it literally your bones get stronger that's been a thing in muay thai and karate for a long time so yeah people don't think in terms of adaptation they think in terms of oh this sucks right now therefore i uh i'm t you know it's bad uh and that's that's a victim mentality that needs to be washed away there's no scientific evidence to support that like overtraining overtraining okay however um overreaching is the short-term feelings you get that make you think you're overtraining but your body will adapt so here's the thing about overtraining. So if you're overreaching, okay, long enough without enough calories, that is when you experience this relative uh, energy deficiency syndrome that we're talking about here. And so what most people think is overtraining is overreaching and under eating calories over a long period of time. And I didn't even know this shit existed. I just knew that I was experiencing this for a long time because of my history with, um, you know, healthy eating and curing disease and basically orthorexia. So if, and if you want to be raw vegan and you want to be, you know, keto and, and, and carnivore, which I'm into keto carnivore diets, you need to be thinking about 
how much fucking calories you're getting. And by the way, raw veganism is not a good idea. You will experience the symptoms of low protein. Uh, and that's just my opinion, but whatever. If you want to believe John McDougall's protein, you know, whatever. Uh, humans aren't gorillas, but whatever. Uh, you're probably going to run into energy deficiency syndrome over time if you're not tracking your calories to make sure you get enough food. Okay. So I see this in my athletes all the time. Their libido goes downhill. Their sleep starts to go downhill. Their, their fucking mood goes downhill. They get sick when they're cutting weight. So, yeah. So right now I'm cutting weight for my competition. And I know I'm going to win uh, the division that I'm doing. But after this, I'm going to just eat a shit ton of calories probably and a lot of protein. Uh, <laughs> because... Yeah, uh, yeah, just because uh, I think that I've been experiencing this on and off for a long time. So anyway, um, but I'm actually, I've been doing good for a long time, but I don't know. Whatever, guys and girls, uh, hope you like this damn video. Let me know down in the comments if you had experience with this, and I'll talk to you all next time.